This is Duke University. Good afternoon, and welcome to the first Distinguished Speaker Series event of the year. I am pleased to introduce Duke alum David Taylor, the current president and global health and the current president of Global Health and Grooming. Mr. Taylor joined P&G right after graduating Duke in 1980, and has held various roles in the U.S., Europe, China, and Hong Kong. He was formerly president of Global Home Care and president of Global Family Care. Mr. Taylor has also held various positions in the Pampers Division, as well as the health as well as the hair care and anti-counterfeiting group. He currently is a board member at TRW Automotive, the Cincinnati Free Store Food Bank, and Feeding America. In addition, he is on the board of visitors at the Fuqua School of Business. Please help me welcome David Taylor. Can everyone hear me? Whether or not the, the microphone is working, okay. So look, uh, apologies for the, the, the false start there, uh, but, but it's really fantastic to have David join us today. One of the things that is at the core uh, of our values is loyal community, and we are very, very fortunate that you happen to share that, uh, that core value, and you've been incredibly loyal to Duke University. You've been incredibly loyal to the business school. And um, I, I am curious, you were born in Charlotte, and probably in Charlotte, most people are going to be UNC or state fans. That How would is be it true. that you became connected to Duke? Uh, <laughs> should I say smarter than everybody else? Uh, actually, I, my first exposure to Duke came with my brother. My older brother actually graduated from uh, the engineering school. So when I was in high school, I had the chance to come up and visit Duke many times, and it was very clear when I was in high school that Duke was an outstanding choice. So that's where I first learned about it. Okay, so you are, uh, if, if we're kind of counting, you're now a quadruple Dukey in the sense of not only did you go to Duke, but yes. three of your children yes. have gone to Duke. So my question is, uh, did you tell your kids you can go anywhere you want to college, but I'm only paying if you go to Duke? <laughs> That's supposed to be my joke. <laughs> no, I, actually, when it started out, my oldest was thinking about another school, but the more he kept coming back to Duke, the more Duke attracted him. And the same was true for my second and my third. My youngest son right now uh, is a junior in uh, Trinity. So all three kids chose to come here. I didn't do the, uh, you can go anywhere you want, but I'll pay if you go to Duke. Uh, but I really am glad they came because I've gotten to come to basketball games for the last 15 years and football games in both programs are outstanding. So you, you now hold a position where, to, to kind of put it into context or, uh, or perspective, if your group was spun off as an independent company, it would be a Fortune 150 company. So you, you, you have a very significant uh, leadership role. And I want to talk a little bit about some of the choices that you made leading up to that mm -hmm. position. And one of the things I find most interesting is that coming out of an engineering program, you then went into plant management. Mm -hmm. And within about 10 years, I think you actually became a plant manager. Mm -hmm. And then you went from that to becoming an assistant brand manager. After having been a very senior person, you made that switch. So my mm -hmm. question is, how, how is it that you came to make such a bold decision at that point in your career? Well, I'd, I had spent the first 11 years of my career in product supply in four different plants within P&G. And what became clear the longer I was in product supply was I was very interested in the total business at P&G. And in our company, if you aspire to senior management, you really need to understand brand building. We are a company focused on serving consumers. We work with customers to ultimately get to the consumers and you've got to understand that part of the business. And so when I was the plant manager, I remember talking with some of our senior managers about in a long term what I was interested in, and it became clear if I really aspired to go beyond the functional leadership roles, which I was very much enjoying, that I needed to um, move to brand building. And the company's view at that time, which I think was brilliant, 
was if you really want to learn about brand building, you ought to start over and learn from the ground up because the opportunity to learn and truly be a student is much higher as an assistant brand manager than laterally coming in and trying to run a large organization with little understanding. Did you have a, a mentor who, who helped you? Because it, it seems like such a, a, a tough choice to make. Uh, yes, uh, and certainly I recommend no matter what company people go to, to have somebody that you trust that you can talk to. Because at that time, you can think about it, I was running a plant of 1,280 people, big facility, and the next thing up was a director of many plants, and it wasn't far off in the future to see an opportunity to be a vice president or above within the function. And the chance to go back and start over meant starting over literally. The cube that I had had a new hire from Wharton and a new hire from Harvard, and it probably was a new hire from Fuqua as well, within the cube that we were in. And it was literally starting over with other people, much like yourselves when you start with P&G, but it was exactly the right thing to do. Mm -hmm. In addition to being a great way to learn the business, it was a fabulous lesson in humility and how to come back and, and really listen and learn and it provided to me the foundation later to understand brand building at a very different level I ever would have understood mm -hmm. it. And the mentor that I talked to said, I believe the skills that you've learned in product supply or manufacturing will serve the company well if you have the ability and interest to do this work. And the only way to find out is jump in. Mm -hmm. Don't audit the course, take the course. So the, the, the role of mentors is extremely important. Do you have advice for everyone here around how do you, how do you find those people who can help you with the, the difficult choices that you, you have to make during your career? I, I think the best mentor relationships I've ever had, either way, as uh, a mentor of others or people mentoring me, are ones that were developed organically. We try to make matches in our company if people don't have them. But generally, you can tell pretty early whether they take off or not. And the other thing I'd say is there's a big role for the mentor and mentee to create the relationship where you can have honest dialogue. And many people don't want that. They want just a little bit of information as opposed to being vulnerable and really allowing yourself to share you know, what, how you really feel about an opportunity. Mm -hmm. And likewise, giving the mentor space to really share openly without it being something that's very hierarchical. Mm -hmm. And the best ones I've had have been very trusting relationships that were truly off the record. Mm -hmm. So how, how do people make themselves known? You're, you're now very, very senior, and everyone, everyone wants to succeed in, the, in their companies. Sure. How is it that you, you, you make yourself look like someone who is on the right path from your point of view? Yeah, I think there's many ways people can set themselves uh, apart in a way, in a positive way. And one of the reasons, frankly, I come here so much and, and our company chooses to come here is the environment that is created at Fuqua is very much the environment we're trying to create and, and I think do have within Procter & Gamble. And that is we want people that are distinguished in their capabilities, people that have a record of achievement, but people that truly believe that no one is smarter than everyone, or that, that no one is smarter than a total group. And, and what I look for is people that emerge as leaders out of a team and do so in a way where they help the team to outperform. And there are several things that we can observe that distinguish people in areas like intellectual agility or emotional intelligence or drive. And in those three areas, you can start to get evidence that people have capabilities well beyond the level that they're currently in. And we look for then opportunities or experiences to really let them excel in any one of those areas, intellectual agility, emotional intelligence, or so they have the capacity to handle much more. Mm -hmm. How did you discover you had a passion for leadership? Uh, probably before I came to Duke. You know, one of the best ways in my mind I learned what I really wanted to do was what I did with my free time. I grew up, like many of you, probably had good schools, uh, good grades in high school, and I did very well in math and science, so I decided I probably should go be an engineer. Looked like a good path. And when I got to Duke Engineering, things were going very well, and my professors were saying, you really ought to consider graduate school. And the companies that were recruiting me, by and large, were very technical companies because of my academic background. But in the free time I had, where my peers in, at Duke Engineering may have been building a car, or doing some all kinds of really interesting projects that they make available to you there, I was working with Big Brothers, Big Sisters, or in other groups. The magazines that I read were Fortune and Business Week and other things, and they were reading IEEE. 
And I said, if this is what I like to do with my free time, that's probably something that ought to give me insight to what I want to do. So when I interviewed, and it was a great time to come out in 1980. It was not hard to get four or five offers. I had an offer from IBM to do some really interesting things in HP. And there was a company called Procter & Gamble that said, you can come into a technical career path, but you also have the opportunity, if you demonstrate the proficiency, to go into one that offered more leadership opportunities. And at the side in the summer, I was in a role that gave me supervisory experience as a, I was a supervisor at Carowinds, a theme park in Charlotte, North Carolina. And in that role, it was about bringing groups of people together to take care of customers and deliver records. We wanted to have the most throughput in a safe way. And that really was exciting to me. And all through my college career, I looked for opportunities to work, for team, work with teams to make things happen, and generally in a less technical environment. And that was, that was when the light bulb went off. It said, I had an aptitude here, but I really have interest and passion in the area of working with people. And so manufacturing gave me a little of both. Technical problem solving was valued, but it was bringing groups of people together. And I specifically asked for a shift team manager where I'd get a chance to work with and lead a group of people for my first assignment. Hmm. I know you, you firmly believe in continuous learning. What, what about leadership has been most challenging for you? What, where do you feel like it's, these are the hardest things that you've had to try to learn? Uh, generally, things in, the, in, in evaluating and, and helping people because especially in a company that's a promote from within, you get to know people very, very well. And, and I've learned over time that you have to decide what's right for the company, then do it the right way, consistent with your principles and values. If you mix those two up, you can paralyze yourself and not make difficult decisions that are good for the enterprise, but may be difficult for an individual that you truly care about. And, and, and the way I at least have dealt with it over time is work very hard if someone, for instance, isn't a good match to help them come to the same conclusion and to help them with whatever's next. But it's very difficult because when you believe and, and, and get, build strong relationships with people, there's a tendency to not want, want to make the decision that's probably right for them as well as right for the organization. So generally, uh, personnel or management uh, evaluation of talent. Mm -hmm. the, the example you gave, uh, it, it brings to the forefront the, the idea of integrity. Mm -hmm. And uh, one of our core values is uncompromising integrity, and I know Excellent. that you, you firmly believe uh, in that, the importance of, of, mm -hmm. of integrity. Was there a defining moment for you where you realized that, that you can't trade off these things, that, that, that integrity can't be mixed with, with doing, being nice or something like that? Yeah. I don't know if there's a defining moment. There's many times in my career, often in, in high-stress points, where I think you're faced with deciding what's really important to you personally. An example would be on an assignment. Many of us, probably most in this room, are very career-minded. You really want to get ahead. At different times of your life, I've given the company different degrees of flexibility. But I think one of the most difficult ones that occurred many years ago was when there was a tremendous opportunity from a career standpoint uh, that the company gave and said, we'd really like you to do this. And a senior manager talked to me and said, we'd really like you to do this. Uh, and it was a time when I had children that were in high school. And we talked with my wife, and we really decided this was, would be a, a challenging time to move the family. And I decided I did not want to do it. And then the company said, we'd like you to talk to somebody else that was a little higher in case I didn't fully get the idea. And that was, this is a really good opportunity. And we had a couple rounds of that. And at the end, it really was a choice about at that point in time in my life what was most important. And what was most important was we needed stability. I'd moved many times, so I'd been very flexible. And I think flexibility is important if you have aspirations to grow and get the opportunity for different experiences. But it's also critical that each of us know where our boundaries are. And everybody gets to define those. I honestly believe for the people I lead, part of my role is to help them articulate on their terms what does success look like, and then to help them make it happen in a way that's consistent with what the company's needs are and theirs, but not to impose my view. Now, what was wonderful about this experience is when I finally came clearly to the point where the company understood this wasn't right, the company said, good, we just wanted to make sure because we really think this would have been good for you and the company, but we also respect the choice. And obviously, it hasn't gotten in the way of, of, of future development. Mm -hmm. But it, it, it reinforced to me 
that you need to know where your boundaries are. And the thing is, people often say, you know, I'm, I'm not flexible, is that going to stop my career? At some point in time, there's probably a degree of flexibility that's needed. But it can occur at different points of time. What needs to happen all the time is that you have a meaningful impact on the organization and whatever you're being asked to do. If you leave a track record of achievement in a way that builds the group of people you're working with and delivers results, I think any reasonable company will work with you on when and how much flexibility mm -hmm. you demonstrate. So you, you clearly did accept many of these assignments. You, uh, you yes. lived and worked in many parts of the Asia world. Asia and Europe, yep. So tell, tell me what, what is so valuable about accepting those assignments to, to be a part of different cultures. I, I, it, it is hard to articulate the growth that happened when I left the U.S. I'd been in the U.S. for 18 years with P&G. I'd grown up within the manufacturing organization, then come to Cincinnati in our brand management. I'd been assistant brand manager, brand manager director, and things were going very well. And the company gave me the opportunity to go to Asia to be the general manager of our Hong Kong business, all brands that P&G had in Hong Kong, which means interfacing with customers, and then running the operating side and the P&L side of our hair care business, which was a many hundred million dollar business in greater China. I'd never been in hair care, never been to China, never been to Hong Kong, never run any of the brands except for the baby care group, and I'd never been a general manager. The growth that happened when you come in with a new level, new job, new position, to me is tremendous because within a very short period of time, our group delivered very good results. And what was crystal clear was I did not have the skills necessary to do all that needed to occur. Collectively, my lead team and I did have the skills. And if ever there was a chance to demonstrate the power of diversity, I got to experience it the next couple years when I was there. Because we had folks from all over the world, plus many local Chinese leaders. And together, we worked where we, we learned from each other, and we delivered very strong results. And it brought to life for all of us the, the, the power of team, the power of learning from each other. You, you said something to me today that, that I found fascinating, which is you, you said, are you listening or are you waiting to speak? Yes. And uh, can, you, can you help us understand the, the difference between those and um, that, that clearly there's one that you prefer over the other? How do you encourage the right behaviors? That's a, it's a great question. And, and again, I'd ask anybody to think about when you're in a discussion, a really important discussion, are you typically in the environment of, I'm truly listening to the person that's speaking to fully understand their point of view and consider that thought before I respond? Or are you truly working real hard on your response so that you have a nice, articulate, tight response? Many times, I think, there's a group of people all waiting to speak. And so they're not listening, but they're waiting to speak. There was a saying I heard often in Western cultures where people kind of go at it, and the person that talks the slowest is declared the listener. You just have people almost talking on each other. When I went to Asia, it was a dramatically different experience because there was a very respectful quiet in a meeting where one person talked. And you'd have people nodding their head. I said, they understand and they agree. No, <laughs> they hear me. <laughs> they didn't agree. They heard me. And, and it took a lot of time to really get to know the individual and the culture from which they are from for us to communicate. And, and I became a much better student of trying to create an environment where I listened to the people that I work with because they have so much to add. And then, in many cases, even tried to play back what I thought I heard to make sure I properly understood what they were intending to convey, even if that's not exactly what they said or what I heard. And in doing so, to me, I've become a better listener. And then I've learned also that part of my role as a leader is to create space, space for conversation, space for dissension, space for disagreement, and I've come to really appreciate messy meetings where we disagree with each other respectfully, because out of that, you often get a level of alignment that is so different from more of a command control, let me tell you what we're gonna go do. And that's critical in a company where you hire extremely bright, motivated people. Mm -hmm. Let's talk about failure, which is something that you clearly haven't experienced a lot of, given your, your success, but, um, but we all fail at different times. And so can you, can you tell us about a time that, that for you was, you, it felt like a big failure for you at the time? And how, how do you recover? What did you learn from that in terms mm -hmm. of your ability to, to grow and move on? That's a great question. And, and 
Certainly I and I'm sure most people have meaningful failures. The question is what you do with it, not whether you fail. Uh, one of the other my favorite sayings is, the only failure is an absence of learning. And I'll give an example where I failed, uh, and it, it cost money and time. Uh, when I was in China, in addition to running my operating business, I was named the brand franchise leader for a new brand we were creating called Ascend. And, and it was a brand with a very specific positioning in addition to the portfolio brands we had. And we worked with the agency and a, and, and a very talented local brand team to develop advertising and packaging and actually got ready and did launch it in the test region. And then shortly after that, we decided that the positioning that we had was one that was very strong. And so the company and me, because I was the general manager, said this just needs to be on our biggest brand. So we put that same positioning as a flanker on our two biggest hair care brands. And, and my new brand went up, it went down very fast. And, and I learned a great deal. And ended up, uh, we ended up pulling it from the marketplace because we found that it didn't have sufficient ability to carve out a, a niche that one of our other brands couldn't carry in addition to the other benefits that the brand had. And, and in that, it, it did fail, and we, we shut it down. But I learned a great deal about brand building. I learned a great deal about uh, when you have secondary benefits and you have a leadership brand thinking if it's really a benefit that's going to uh, live in the future, and it's consistent enough with the primary benefit that you ought to put it on your leadership brand. And we've gotten very focused in many cases at making sure we let our lead brands go as far as they can go and, and really live on the shoulders of strong uh, consumer love brands. I also learned how to reward people that thought they had failed. The brand manager was outstanding. Later we promoted her, gave her an international assignment, and she continued to flourish. And the agency did some of the best creative work I have ever seen in my career, but yet we shut it down and discontinued the brand, and they had to move people off the brand. And so I tried to separate what failed. And I had failed as the brand franchise leader to build a new brand, but I had learned how to get the ultimate outcome, which is grow my hair care business. And frankly, all of us became stronger leaders as a result of that. The brand manager ended up getting promoted and having a very strong career. The agency uh, went on and, and handled other work within P&G. But at times, we love to kind of bury what doesn't work and talk about what does, mm -hmm. when sometimes the most fertile learning comes from what doesn't work. A lot of people have, have talked about the, one of the big issues that you face in the corporate world is driving a spirit of innovation and a, a reasonable level of risk taking, not stupid risk taking, right. but people that you want people who, who will take risks. Did that, did that example help you kind of internalize and think through how do we encourage a culture of, of appropriate risk taking? Yeah, I think so, and, and I think it's one we constantly have to learn because it is difficult to accept that many of the things you're going to do aren't going to work. And no one wants to, quote unquote, sign up to work on something they don't think is going to be successful. But in, if, if we're not careful, we will not take many shots, and we won't find the new big idea. Often the best ideas do come from the fringes, and it's not obvious they're going to work. You know, we had a conversation about great innovators, and, and there, are, there is a view of this brilliant person that has this amazing insight. And sometimes there are some people that are, that are just remarkably gifted. But often it comes from learning from others and a lot of things that failed first. And from that, we got insight that led to something that was a bigger breakthrough going forward. And I've got high respect for those that have the confidence in themselves, the self-confidence to articulate, I really want to go for this and take personal risk and career risk to go for things. And frankly, I would rather protect them if it doesn't work, because we need more of those to me in corporate America, or really in corporate anything, but certainly in, in Procter & Gamble. We need more of those folks. We need bright people that have the strength of conviction to go after ideas they really believe are well-founded in, in real consumer insight with the technology that can be married with that to create something of real value. Mm -hmm. And we won't always be right, yeah. or a big brand may take the idea. So, so P&G uh, went through a, a period of, of great global expansion. Yes, we did. And, uh, uh, and in some sense, you could argue they've, they've been going through global expansion for, for many, many years. Decades. But you've been in the press quite a bit lately in terms of um, 
of this idea of you need to shrink to grow. And my, my question for you is, how, how does that change your leadership in terms of motivating and inspiring people when, when you're saying, we're going to, we're going to shrink back, but, but we're, going to, we're going to get that back in even more? How do, mm -hmm. how do you make that happen as opposed to people feeling like, oh, we're, we're, not, we're not moving in the right direction here? Sure. One, the choices the company will make on portfolio will be made and they'll be announced one day when we do make a choice. The vast majority of our businesses we plan to build and, and have in our portfolio for the future. And what I often tell folks in the way I deal with things that I don't fully know all the data is there is a circle of, of control and a circle of influence and a circle of concern. And, and I try to personally and with my team stay very focused at those things we can do something about. And the better job we do and the brands that we have and the regions that we do business, the better we're going to be in almost every circumstance, whether the business ultimately is one that we stay and grow or whether the business we choose to do something different. Um, and most people want to make a difference and say, you know, we can speculate if something may, you know, a, a business may not be part of the portfolio in the future, um, but there's really not a real constructive outcome from doing that. And, and so we do, we, we focus on, on, on what we control and we do the best job we can to understand the environment in which we're making decisions and involve others that need to, to be involved. Most people want badly to be part of a winner. And so we focus on achievement and growth. And achievement and growth, I think folks can get behind. And the better we do and the faster we do that, the more we're putting ourselves in, in a good position under almost any eventuality. Mm -hmm. And again, the other thing to keep it in perspective, the vast majority of the business is going to be with us. I think what the company has publicly said is, you know, over 90% of our sales and 95% of our profits, we fully expect to be part of the future of Procter & Gamble. Mm -hmm. So it is a relatively small part. But you're right, it can cause a lot of folks to wonder. And the best way to deal with that is to stay focused on those things you can impact, mm -hmm. which mm -hmm. is doing my job, my organization's job, in an outstanding way, and creating the environment where people can learn and grow. Yeah. So I was, I was thinking of asking you a question which I know would make you very uncomfortable. Uh -oh, then I wouldn't is, do that then without even okay, going there. Yeah, so I was going to ask you what, 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 what do you think makes you such an effective leader? And I know that would, that would not fly over well with yeah. you. So let me try to get to it in another way, which is are there, are there people out there that you greatly respect and admire and you feel yes. like, you, they've given you great leadership insights through either their words or actions, behaviors, and so on. Absolutely. Yeah. I have been blessed with the opportunity to work with an amazing group of people throughout my career, and frankly, starting here at Duke University. You know, whether it was, whether it was uh, fellow students or professors, almost everybody I've worked with, I've been able to learn something from. And people said, if you had good bosses, there's not been a boss that I've worked for that I didn't learn something, either learn what to do or not to do, but I learned something. And frankly, the meter ought to be running all the time. We interact with folks, and from that we learn. There are several, though, that I think distinguish themselves in the way they got their work done. And in many of those, some of them still with the company, and some of those have retired, that were just incredible in their passion for the business. It was always the energy was contagious. There's a quote by Colin Powell that says, optimism is a force multiplier. And these are people that give you energy. In a terrible crisis, they come in and they're so focused on making a difference, it elevates the performance of the whole group. And out of that, you, you get charged up. And I want to create the environment where when times are really tough is when they ought to, ought to have the greatest support from management. It's when we're doing really well that ought to be hardest and more demanding because that's a time when we become complacent. And these leaders role model that brilliantly. In the toughest time through the Asian financial crisis, the organization in my hierarchy was very supportive. We had to make drastic steps because the currencies dropped and there was a massive hit on our P&L. And so we had to move a lot of expatriate managers back to their home countries. And out of that, I saw the local managers just step in and take over more responsibility. And it was the time to support them, not be demanding, but to support them. And when I see a leader that creates the space like that in a tough time, you can't help but rededicate yourself to do the same for others. You said something interesting, which is you, you've learned from every boss. Um, Absolutely. One way or another. And mm -hmm. uh, what, what's clear is that you can learn a lot from a bad boss. Absolutely. 
And so I'm curious, what are some of the things that you, that you learned from observing how people were leading in a way that seemed highly ineffective? Without naming names. Many th yeah, many things there as well. You know, we, I, I'm sure everybody has worked for someone that told them what needed to be done and how to do it. When you hire the kind of people we hire, outcomes need to be clear and kind of the boundaries. But then how to get there, you've got to give people a lot of latitude. And when I've had a boss that is very prescriptive, you know, I found that very limiting. And it didn't bring out the best in me, is one thing. When I've had a bosses that tended to be very directive and, and, and tended to want to deploy strategies, I want to work with a boss that wants to engage and enroll me. And you can do that in still a very limited amount of time, but the idea is you believe that I can add something to it, and therefore, let me tell you what we're thinking and why, and, and I'm open to your thoughts, even though we're probably not going to change a strategy developed and aligned with the hierarchy. But there's a dramatic difference in the way they would enroll. Some of the worst bosses I've had would tend to deploy a lot of things. And the kind of leaders we hire in our company want to be engaged and have a chance to have a conversation versus being told. And, and that's probably one of the biggest ones I've seen as a difference. All the bosses I've had have been smart people that wanted to do the right thing, the principal leaders. But their interpersonal skills vary pretty widely. And it's one of the reasons why, in my view of high potential leaders, really understanding and identifying people that have very highly developed uh, emotional intelligence, people that can bring out the best in subordinates, peers, bosses, and other stakeholders in ways that cause people to want to come back for more versus people that get great results, but they do it in a very directive way and doesn't bring out the contributions in the energy level of others. And I've had some that did both. All of them I learned something from. Sadly, the, the chances are that, that everyone in this room is probably going to experience a, a difficult boss. And and it's not sad, though. In many ways, it can be some of the best learning to me, as long as you can stay, you know, hang with it. Well, that's, the, that's the, 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 where I'm headed with this question, which is you can learn, but how do you survive? How, how yeah, do that's you, a fair point. How, how do details, you actually, details. Yeah. <laughs> how, do you, how do you stay on track? In other words, how do you manage that situation in a way that it does not derail your career? My view on that is that individuals that have a track record of success, and especially those that have been at a company for some period of time, or have a track record at other companies that they bring to whatever company they're working with, that uh, that would, would account for something. A way in most companies, and certainly our companies, is you do develop relationships with people beyond your direct boss, and mentors and or sponsors, and we consider them different. One may be just somebody to help coach and provide uh, non-hierarchically based advice. A sponsor may be somebody that's in the hierarchy that's out of your direct reporting chain that you maintain a relationship with. And both of those roles, to me, can be of real value. So as people come in, to the extent they develop a relationship with people, in addition to doing a great job and building a relationship with their boss, of someone that can be a sounding board for ideas with low risk, and also somebody that is a little bit more hierarchical but somebody that is up to date on your contributions and is aware you may have a challenging relationship. Mm -hmm. They can also provide a very helpful both perspective and in some cases intervene if, if the relationship has gotten dysfunctional for either, either person. Mm -hmm. and, I, and I've been involved in doing that before where a good person just got in a relationship that wasn't healthy and, and was able to help you know, intervene. Mm -hmm. I'm going to ask one more question and then uh, I'll ask the audience to, to jump in. Um, so, everyone sitting in the audience uh, is now in a position and in a position to make a choice that you made some years ago. Yes, a few years ago. Uh, what what advice do you have to this group about how they should choose where they go? And and would you say would you choose P and G over again? Yeah, I can say without reservation, I would choose P and G again. And, and in more ways than, than I could articulate real succinctly. But just the fact that I started in manufacturing in Greenville, North Carolina, ended up in Asia, Europe, and now the group president of a large group speaks to me volumes about their willingness to consider non-traditional career paths, which was good for me because I started out as an engineer with an aspiration one day to be a plant manager. But as I learned and grew, many other things became very interesting, and the company was open to consider different possibilities. So I, I, I think in many ways, you've got to start not with wanting to get the biggest check or the, the most prestigious company, whatever it may be. It's really figuring out what motivates you. 
Now, I think the, that having something that you're passionate about in a company that's got enough degrees of freedom for you to experience a range of assignments, to me, gives you tremendous opportunity to grow. I also think it's really important to figure out what you do when you don't have to, when, when you're not required to do something. What do you do with your free time? It was very insightful for me when I started thinking about my junior year, what I do with my free time. Everybody's steering me to this kind of a role, but that's not what I do when I don't, when I've got my own time. And, and, and really, not what you do, it's, it's kind of what are the characteristics? Do you like to work with people? Do you like, whatever it is, getting in touch with that. Because that then gives to me insight into what would cause you to be a passionate contributor. There's no question if you're in this audience and you're at this school that you've got tremendous capability. This school has a tremendous reputation out in the industry for good reason. Academics, tremendous. The environment here that causes you to learn how to work with people, I think, is outstanding. The team-based approach, uh, the, student, the, the faculty is amazing. So those that come out of here are well positioned to have you know, a very strong career wherever you choose. Then I think it's finding the magic match which is a company that offers you the range of experiences that will allow you to grow, and then you finding work that is really exciting. You know, many people would say, which will get me to the high, the senior level faster? And I said, that's really not what I would go after. I'd go after what gets you the most excited. You know, I, I, time flies for me. It's not an issue with how many hours I work. Uh, I really enjoy what I'm doing. I work with amazing people that teach me something every day, and I truly honestly believe that. Um, and I've experienced that in every place I've been, in manufacturing and brand management. I've experienced when I went to Asia with junior Chinese managers that were just remarkably smart and driven and wanted to learn. And they would teach, and they were teaching so much while they thought they were learning from me. And then the same when I went to Europe, a very different environment, very different culture, but tremendous. Um, you know, I think if, if I would offer you anything is just make sure you have a love of learning. If you've got a love of learning, you're very well positioned because I know you've got the intellect and capability, you wouldn't be here. Okay, let me turn it over to the audience. So questions from the audience. Hey, thank you for uh, being here today. Um, so Great. it sounds like you're on a couple boards like outside of, yes. of P&G. First, how do you choose where you spend your time outside of the company and then, and second, is it sort of like an inflow of knowledge or an outflow of knowledge from your perspective to those boards, or do you use those experiences to bring back and sort of try new things at, at P&G? It's a great question, and, it, uh, and I'll separate them in two different areas, in the nonprofit space and in the, the paid board space. Uh, at Procter & Gamble, a senior manager like myself can have one outside paid board experience with the agreement of the company. And the reason the company supports that is the company's view is that with a well-chosen board assignment, you will learn as much as you'll contribute and you'll bring back to P&G different ideas and thoughts. And I'd say my experience has been exactly that with TRW. I sit beside a group of senior managers that I would not have contact with in a whole different industry. Uh, it's a business-to-business -business kind of industry, and it's a very distinguished board. And, and, I, and I remember talking with both A.G. Laffley and Bob McDonald, the, the CEO I had when I first started the, the process of looking at a board and the CEO that was in, uh, leading the company at the time, and both said, make sure that you get to know the CEO and it's somebody that you can work with and learn from and, and that respects you so you can contribute and, and look at the composition of the board and how the board operates because it it's got to be a match for both. And so the intent is it is a two-way street. The, obviously, the, the company that's offering you a board position will do all the vetting and make sure that you have the skills and abilities that they need. Uh, but it's an equally rigorous view. And I turned down several other board opportunities before I said yes to TRW, because once you say yes, in my view, it's a commitment for many years. It takes many years to have the depth of understanding of the company and the senior management team. Even if there's a, a, a quote, unquote, bigger company that may be more prestigious, I wouldn't think about leaving it for at least you know, five, eight years, because I think you've got to give back you know, the, the investment the company makes in you the first several years. So that's the, the, the for-profit side. The nonprofit side, the two areas that have been of interest for me for many, many years, and it's been hunger and education. Uh, and so I got involved with Feeding America, I don't know, probably nine years ago. And you know, a, a very concerning fact is that 35 million Americans are food insecure at some point in time during the year, and over 17 million of those are children. And, and anybody that's taken any look at that, 
understands the just awful impact it can have on a child's ability to learn and then the impact that has for a lifetime. And so Feeding America is a nonprofit based in Chicago that supplies food to 200 food banks, that supplies food to over 30,000 organizations, faith-based soup kitchens to crisis abuse centers. So it, it's something that really makes a difference in the world. And it's been one that has been just a tremendous opportunity to learn and hopefully to contribute. And then the local version is the Free Store Food Bank in Cincinnati. So I've got to see the local uh, food bank that actually works with clients and then the, the parent organization in Chicago. And then when Dean Bolding gave me the opportunity to join the Board of Visitors, it was another area where I think uh, I've got a lot of interest and passion and it's in some way to try to pay back for the tremendous gift that I got, which was a Duke education and that my three sons have, have gotten and are still getting. Uh, and I can say just as the TRW board, I learn more than I give at the Board of Visitors. You get to work with brilliant co-workers or, or fellow Board of Visitors members, which is an extraordinarily distinguished group of people. You get a chance to talk to people like Dean Bolding. You get a chance because each time he brings one or two professors that speak and, and they, they, they're just incredible individuals. You get to deal with it as part of your day-to-day -day world. So it's a real treat to be able to come here and learn from others and then hopefully offer support in some way, whether it's recruit here or to host something in the future that would be beneficial to, to Fuqua or Duke University. Hi, uh, I had a question. Um, I wanted to ask a little question regarding the, the 100 brand, brands that might be divested. Mm -hmm. I want to explore a little bit more on the customer side. So any customers that might be using these brands for 100, like, not 100 years, several years, uh, what would you tell these customers now? Like, would, like if they see this brand as P&G no longer being associated with these brands, mm -hmm. would you tell them, hey, you should still keep using them? Or like, I just wanted to explore that a little bit. Yeah, it, again, it, it varies widely by specific situation. Generally, the reaction from our customers, I think, has been positive because if we can get more focused at driving growth in the brands that fit in the four industry-based sectors that we're choosing to compete in, that's a good thing. And again, the, the, the calculus is much about you know, can we be the best stewards of that brand and grow it, or could someone else do a better job? And if someone else could do a better job, then it's probably best in the hands of somebody different from us, and then we'll focus on those things we can grow. And, and I believe the customers understand and, and support that. And at the end of the day, it's certainly a choice, a strategy choice we have to make, but I don't believe we, I, I haven't had, and I'm not aware of any issue we've had with customers that don't see the, the merit in that choice. And it's, and it's a very thoughtful choice on when we do make a, a, a choice to have something leave our portfolio. Very hard choice, because all of these brands we believe deeply in. But again, it's back to figuring out you gotta choose what's right for the long-term health of the organization and the health of the institution. And then once you figure out what's the right strategy choice, then do it in the right way, consistent with your principles and values. And to me, when you do it that way, generally the employees that are impacted, as well as customers and other stakeholders that are impacted, at least understand, it's still difficult. Other questions? Uh, I have a question. I wonder to compare with other customer product companies such as Mars and Unilever. Uh -huh. What do you think is the core competence of uh, PNG's marketing team? The core competence of PNG versus a Mars or Unilever? Yeah, co uh, compare with yeah, Unilever. I, I won't comment too much on Mars or Unilever because I, I, I can't say I have a greatly informed view other than I respect they're both competitors. Mars I know a little more about because we just sold uh, our America's pet care business to Mars. So I've gotten to meet many of their people and I think they're a fine company with fine principal leaders. And I'm sure the same thing is, is true for Unilever as well, but I have never worked with them closely. Uh, I can speak to what Procter & Gamble is about, and Procter & Gamble is about building brands, and building brands that start with serving consumers that make a meaningful difference in the lives of consumers every day. And to me, while that sounds, you know, a little bit uh, uh, maybe uh, just kitchen soup kind of thing, it is very much the core of who we are as a company, and the company's been around 177 plus years. By understanding consumer needs and better serving those needs in each category we compete, we've been able to build you know, a, a stable of 23, 25 billion dollar brands. But it starts with consumer insights, better meeting the needs of consumers than we think other brands, and then building the brand over time. Brands stand for meaningful benefits, 
and we try to convey that benefit at the zero moment of truth, which is when people first tro go out and try to learn about the brand, at the first moment of truth when they go in the store and get to see us in a competitive set, in the second moment of truth when they actually use our brand in the privacy of their home. And we have to, in, in our brand building approach, be outstanding at the zero, first, and second moment of truth. And that broadened view to me very much informs what we do and what our brand organization spends a lot of their time understanding when consumers first have a, either awareness or an interest in, are we there with the information they need? And are we present when and where they're most receptive to the messages that would give them the information to make an informed choice? Because P&G is not about trying to have a deal to get somebody to try a brand that doesn't meet their need. Our business model is based on, on brands that grow over time. And many of our brands have been around for a long, long time. So we want to delight the consumer by meeting their needs from an information standpoint at the store and in use. Yes, please. Hi. Uh, so one of my questions is you talked about finding your passion and, and then following that to whatever career, whatever you want to do in life. I think it's easier said than done, especially in business school, it's very much a herd mentality that I need to go this way because everyone else is going this way. If I'm not going this way, that means I'm, I'm lost. So how do you actually think about, like, in your own career and, like, you know, with, with your sons and with uh, people you've mentored, how do you actually tell someone to find their path? Because I think it's really easy to compromise and say, well, I like this part of it, but how do you actually discern the things that motivate you? And I guess the second part to that is then how do you actually transform that into, like, what you would do in our position? Like, what would you be your next steps in terms of, like, pursuing career paths and life goals and all that? Sure, sure. I truly believe it starts with self-reflection. What is it that really gets you excited? And, and it's been very helpful to me to look at what I do when I've got free time. You know, one of my favorite definitions of integrity is kind of what you do when nobody looks. You know, what do you do when nobody's looking? What are the things that excite you, that interest you? What do you read when you talk with people? When, what elevates your heart rate? Uh, all of, bless you. All those things to me are really important about uh, finding your passion. The other thing I'll tell you is you may not be right. Whatever you think it is today, it may change. I truly was excited to go into manufacturing and enjoyed my time there. But the longer I was there and the more I got to see other things, I said, that looks really interesting. And I'd love to learn more about it and think I could do that work. And then I started networking with some people to learn more about what would a career in the commercial side of P&G look like. Uh, so it, you don't have to be precise. You just got to know an area that you've got a high interest in, and that's why I think it's important to consider what company you join. And, and because there are some companies that may be more narrow, some that are more broad. And I'm not advocating for either one, but find out. If you've got a very clear passion, you may want to go to a place that really goes deep and is the best in the world at that. If you're not sure and you really like, uh, and variety may not be the word, but a, a range of options to develop your skills, then it may be a company that's got a broader range of development opportunities. Uh, it's not critical to me that one be precise, but they certainly want to start in a place where you can show up excited about work for the first few years so you can distinguish yourself or learn enough to be able to make a mid-course correction. Again, I think you're actually in a very good place and that while there may be a lot of interest in going in one of a few areas because that's where most go, you know, when I was here at engineer, when I was an engineering student, the vast majority would have said, "You turned down at that time IBM, which was at the top, or Hewlett Packard, or Bell Labs." I said, "Yeah, because that's not what I really want to do." And I remember professors talking to me and said, and, and to, I think they almost felt that I was wasting my engineering degree because you're not going to one of these premier companies or going to grad school. But I said, actually, Duke gave me a, a phenomenal gift, which is of problem solving, and that's played out for 34 years at P&G. My engineering background has allowed me to be very good at framing an issue, and if it's a really tough issue, I break it up into small issues that I can solve. And if this break it up to three and they're tough to solve, I break it up into six, and I get a group of people to help me with each one, and we'll get the big one solved. But engineering is about problem solving, and frankly, whether it's marketing or a, a challenging problem in Asia, it is about problem solving and bringing groups of people together that collectively have the skills and that's what I like to do. I think I could work for a number of companies. Procter & Gamble just happened to be a wonderful match with the principles and values of the company, with 
my principles and values. I'm sure there are other companies that could have been good fits, but I don't regret for a second that I chose P&G. Other questions or thoughts? Hi, uh, thank you. Um, you uh, mentioned that when you are like looking for people to build up a meaningful connect connection well, with your mentor, uh, you said be authentic and show you show being be vulnerable. Yes. And I wondered, like, when you like at this process when we recruit, we are always re like taught to present the best side of ours, like like pretend to be better than who we actually are a little bit. <laughs> there you go, you like that one? <laughs> um, so I, like I also I wonder <laughs> like how to, how to like preserve that authenticity like and also in a teamwork process, like if you show your uh, be vulnerable, how do you still like keep the, the leadership as a, in, your, in your group? Like those kind of things I want to know, thank you. Yeah, there's a, there's a lot there. Certainly, I, I think that the, the counsel to have a good presence when you're meeting with, with, with companies is probably a, still a good idea. Uh, <laughs> I, I, I probably wouldn't start out with the vulnerability part on the, 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 with the recruiters uh, because, frankly, you've got limited initial time to, 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 have, to establish a good impression. But again, most companies, I believe, that are really interested in you, once you get past the first screening so that you get into more substantive conversation, do want to go deeper in understanding what is it you're really interested in. I can speak for, for certainly the company that I work for, is we're not interested in getting somebody that's amazing that really doesn't want to do our work. So I really do want to find out where your passion is and what you're really interested in doing and what your view of success would be in five to 10 years. Because if I really can't meet that with the career path we have available, it's really not in my interest or yours to pursue it. So maybe not vulnerable to me is one I'd probably think about in a relationship a little later where you're trying to get counsel and coaching to learn as opposed to the recruiting process. But in the recruiting process, I do think you want a level of candor and honesty about what you're interested in because you know, you're going to have many companies that will be interested in you and you'll get a chance to talk with them. And to the extent you present your best self but also can at least let them know where your real passion and interest is, you can probably find a good match. And certainly I, I, and I'm sure you do, want to have options. So that's why I did when I showed up to IBM. I certainly was interested in what they had to offer when I was interviewing many years ago. But I was open about I wanted to, to be successful in a technical environment, but I wanted opportunities to demonstrate leadership. And they would talk about it, and it would come later in the career for the career path they were talking. And with P&G, it could occur writing my first assignment where I would be in a, in a role that had problem solving and people leadership. And right or wrong, that seemed very appealing to me. Others, every company I talked to was willing to articulate how you would get leadership opportunities. But I had to put that through the lens of what I thought would be the best match for me. And I do believe you know, you're going to have many options that are probably very interesting to you. But being in touch, it's surprising to me how many people, when I ask, even in my own company in P&G, you know, what is your destination? They'll often say, I want to get promoted. I go, that's not a destination. That's you want to move from where you, have to, where you are today. What is it that really interested you? And then when they can think about what they really like to do in five or 10 years, I may have a very different path than what they're thinking about because the quicker promotion may not give them the experience that prepares them to be much, much more qualified for the role that could give them the, the, the real discontinuity in their development which is why having somebody that you can be very open about, this is what I really want to do in, in 10 or 15 years, knowing that could change, but this is what really interests me. You can get honest counsel once you're in a company. You, you've got to get in the door, and so I would have a wonderful presence and be very articulate with the, with the recruiters so that you get a chance to let people see the tremendous capability that you offer them. Yes, right here. I'll just speak loud. Very good. So, uh, global brands, one of the challenges is contextualizing to the local yes. area. And so this is a two-part question. One, I'm wondering about the tension of taking some of your brands to Asia, trying to hold the integrity of that brand, but then to really contextualize it to those markets. And then when I think of consumer brands, most of them go from west to east. There's a lot of interest in China and other Asian markets. Yes. And in big brands that have western... Um, size and, and uh, recognition. Do you see any brands coming east to west or yes. any new ideas of innovation coming east to 
though. Yeah. What about the transition going from here? Yes. Centralizing and reversing from the other way. Right. It, right. Just a couple thoughts. One, uh, as we take brands that were very successful in the U.S. and try to launch them, and whether it is in, in a China or Japan or in, in the ASEAN countries, what we try to do, and it generally works for us, is make sure the human benefit is real, and the human benefit generally travels very, very well. For most of our brands, it is about, you know, if, and you can take different areas. If it's a, a brand in, in the health and grooming area, it's going to be about maybe a therapeutic benefit. It's in the health side, and that's going to be, transcend cultures pretty much. If it's Gillette, it'll be about the ability to have a close, comfortable shave. And that generally does travel very well. And you see we have very high shares in many countries. How we articulate that benefit, what we show in the advertising, the tone of the commercial, the character that we have is very much adapted to meet the needs of the audience. There are some brands where you'll have a national, or rather a global campaign. We have many that do not have global campaigns, that rather we adapt the communication in a way that is appropriate for that specific culture, especially in areas where you see wider differences uh, on our customs that would cause you to have to be very sensitive. And that can occur in some personal care categories where there are many sensitivities that we would really have the local team help. And I can give one fun story. Uh, many years ago when I was on uh, a family care business, or Tissue Tau, we had a campaign that ran in the US for many years that was very successful called Little Kids Big Spills, where there would be a, a setup that would have a kid play in and they'd create a spill and then you know mom would be alarmed and then Bounty would come to the rescue and, and because of its performance would kind of resolve the tension and then you had a, a, a demonstration that demonstrated the benefits. We ran that in the UK for a while and it was doing okay but the, 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 the brand was very flat. And, and when I first moved from Asia to Europe, or rather from, yeah, from Asia to Europe, Literally the first month or so, and I was new to the category, I had an assistant brand manager and a brand manager come to me and said, we've got a great idea for a new campaign. I said, great, on Bounty. I said, well, there's a global campaign. They said, we think this is really, really going to work. It'll cause the consumer to suspend disbelief and really get the core message. And we've got these two guys dressed up as ladies that kind of knock themselves around the kitchen. They create a mess. It's a little Monty Python-ish. And, and it's going to be great. And I said, hmm. Let me take it. I went back to Cincinnati and showed it to some of the experts. And they go, oh my goodness, David, what do you think? And Bounty is a leadership brand. We've got a great campaign. But to their credit, they said, you know, you need to figure out what's right for your local market. And the passion that the, the assistant brand manager and the brand manager that were from the UK had for that, I said, you know, let's develop it and, and, and let's go with it. And we launched that brand. The brand grew that year 25% with zero product changes for our best year of growth. That campaign lived on for many years and went to some other countries. And, and the, the, the learning principle was listen to the people closest to the consumer. The benefit was the same. It, it, it had wet strength and it, the, the bounty, the quicker picker up, or it, it, the performance message was there, but they got it much better with the creative envelope that the local team had developed. And that campaign then traveled to many places. So traveling west to east, it's about making sure the core benefit delivers superior performance, but it's articulated in a way that causes the consumer to suspend disbelief and get the brand message in a way that's respectful to the consumer and communicates persuasively. And that's going to look differently at times. Sometimes it doesn't. The other, the other way is also happening. It's not will it happen. It is happening. We have some brands that started in Asia that have now traveled and become bigger brands in other parts of the world. And actually, many of the innovations, some of the most discerning Consumers in the world are Japanese consumers, amazingly demanding on the level of performance. Some remarkable packaging is occurring in Korea and other markets. So we're learning by category, where does the innovation start? In some cases, it starts in Japan or Korea, then it comes to China, and all of a sudden, the costs come down, and then it becomes broadly available at an accessible price point. So what we need to be is present in the places where the innovation first occurs and understand it can go west to east or east to west. And it varies by category. But that's why the power of having individuals in each of these markets in a culture that accepts that learning comes from the person that has the greatest understanding of the consumer need in the, 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 the marketplace, not necessarily the most impressive business card. The most impressive business card needs to be open to learn from everywhere and create the environment where great ideas can travel and have a chance to breathe. all the time we have. So uh, David, thank you so much thank for your you. time. And uh, <clears throat> that's a 
a token of our appreciation, we just want to present this gift to you as well. Thank you so much. Thank you. My pleasure. My pleasure. Many thanks. Uh, thank you.